Manchester's home to Kate Silk, a regular northern lass. With a loving husband and two lovely daughters, her life seems perfect. But behind the smiles is an embarrassing secret. Kate's addicted to cheese. I won't put it in my mouth if it isn't cheese. It's quick, it's easy, it's tasty, and I know I like it. Kate isn't the only freaky eater in the family. Both her daughters are following in her dietary footsteps. That is medium. Kate's desperate to change, but new foods drive her to despair. I just can't put it in my mouth. But help is at hand. Clinical psychologist Stephen Briars and nutritionist Natalie Savona will try to help Kate beat her addictions. Natalie's job is to encourage Kate to embrace new foods. You just need to get where your banana boundary is. <laughs> While Stephen will push her to deck the demons that drive her hatred of healthy food. Perhaps your early school experience wasn't that happy. I used to get really, really hungry. They've got just four weeks to reverse a lifetime of bad eating habits. I'm bored, hungry, and fed up. <coughs> if somebody could wave a magic wand or hypnotise me, and then I could eat everything, that would be perfect. 37-year-old teaching assistant Kate Silk lives in Manchester with husband Jeff. He's stepdad to her two daughters, 14-year-old Megan, and 12-year-old Georgia. <laughs> Kate's a devoted mum who loves to spend time with her family, but behind closed kitchen doors, life is no walk in the park. Because Kate's diet is almost exclusively cheese. I'll eat cheese sandwiches, cheese and crackers. I have a jacket potato with cheese every day at work for my dinner. Morning, Kate. Usual. Yes, thank you. And I usually come home and have cheese and crackers every night for my tea. It's my favourite food. Eating mostly cheese every day for the last 30 years has turned Kate into something of a connoisseur. The salt and vinegar's dead zingy, so it goes great with the taste of Lancashire. The roast chicken's more of a savoury flavour, so that goes well with cheddar and the digestives. And then the smoky bacon goes really well with the other crackers and the soft cheese. I think the reason I stick with cheese is because I have that memory of eating it from being a little girl, it's so safe. So I know that I can tolerate it and eat it and it won't make me sick or it won't make me feel uncomfortable. Kate has one other safe food and it's the only home-cooked meal she'll eat, her mum's roast dinner, but only if it's cooked by her mum and only if she eats it at her mum's house. It goes against everything else that I usually eat because I have a full roast dinner with loads of gravy on it. But I can remember having that every Sunday from being a little girl. I've been cooking the same Sunday lunch for even more than 25 years, so ever since she was a child. It's lovely, Mum, thank you. Mum Jean never gets the opportunity to experiment with her cooking. The menu has to be the same every week. If I varied the menu, she wouldn't eat it. So it's useless preparing something that she's not going to eat. It upsets her, it gets me all het up. But I know that the same, it's very boring and dull, really, but I know that she'll eat it. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Cheers. Other than this weekly roast, it's cheese all the way. Kate cannot bear to touch anything else. It just looks like slop. I find it very difficult to taste anything that's sloppy, whether it's a stew or a curry um, or anything that has sauce on the top of it. Okay. Sadly for husband Jeff, Kate's fear of anything hot and saucy means his home cooked specialities are her worst nightmare. Would you try it, sis? If Jeff's cooking something, he'll say when it's done, are you going to taste it? And then as it gets nearer, I can feel myself getting really, really anxious. So then when it actually comes to the point where I have to taste it, I'm heaving usually before I've even put it in my mouth. That's horrible. Oh, dear. <laughs> I always cook for myself only, because she won't have what I'm eating, neither will the girls. And that does make me sad. Though Jeff is accustomed to her strange behaviour, he's seriously worried about the impact it's having on their children. There you go, sweetheart. Especially 12-year-old Georgia. Dye, breaded chicken, potato processed. But I don't eat pasta. I don't eat fish. I do eat the occasional burger. Oh, it's got something on it. But I am normal on the crisp and chocolate front. 
family's biggest passion is exotic travel, but finding food to please everyone is a recipe for a disaster. When we go on holiday, it can be a nightmare. There are even occasions where I have gone into an establishment and eaten on my own. Sometimes with Kate and the girls who are eating nothing and just having drinks. A lifetime of eating cheese is finally taking its toll on Kate's patience. I'm bored of the food I'm eating. It's so repetitive. And even if you change from Lancashire to cheddar cheese, it's still the same texture, it's still the same crackers. It's got to the point now where if somebody could wave a magic wand or hypnotise me, and then I could eat everything, that would be perfect. It's day one of Kate's month-long dietary makeover and she's been summoned to London for her first meeting with psychologist Stephen and nutritionist Natalie. Kate, <laughs> hi. <Hello>. Hi. <laughs> I'm Natalie, nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Hi, I'm Stephen. Hi, pleased Hello. to meet you. So what feelings are uppermost in you at this moment? Um, just wanting to know what you're going to do and what you're going to say to me, really. Today, We've got something that we want to show you that we think will help kickstart this whole process of changing what you eat. OK. Before they begin their work, Natalie and Stephen have a surprise for Kate, which they hope will focus her mind. Kate, I think you're aware already that the next few weeks are going to be quite difficult at times. What we've got here today is something that we hope will be a bit of a motivational tool for you. Natalie and I are going to leave you to watch it, and we'll be over there, and then we're going to come back and talk to you afterwards. OK. The eating problem that you have, Kate, obviously impacts on us on a daily basis. One of the things that really concerns me is how the girls are following your eating habits. I don't think it's been easy living in the same house as someone with such a limited diet. It makes me feel a bit upset because it hasn't helped what I eat and what Georgia eats. I get really concerned about my health because I'm not being able to eat everything all my friends at school eat and be able to go out and have an ordinary meal. Georgia is almost frightened of going on holiday. She hates the thought that she's going to have to almost starve herself. Holidays are meant to be a happy time and I really enjoy them. But when you don't eat, you get stressed. And then we all get upset because we know that it's a problem. It is limiting for us and it is meaning that we can't go to places that we would really like to. I am so, so proud of you, of what you're trying to do to readdress your eating habit. But if you could possibly... I'm sorry, I can't carry on. I'm sorry, sweetheart. <laughs> so how was it watching that? Um, obviously, my mum got very upset. I didn't realise that she was as concerned as she is. Now, I don't want to make anybody else's life unhappy because of something that I'm doing. What about the impact of what you're doing on Georgia? Had you really, really thought about how dramatic the connection is between your diet and hers? Yes, and, and because of my issues with food, I didn't feel in a position to tackle her when she stops eating food because I thought if I make a big scene, I wouldn't like somebody to do that to me. And as far as the holidays are concerned? <laughs> Our passion as a family is to travel. We love going on holiday. And the last thing after you've had a really good day out is to then cause loads of anxiety and spend hours traipsing around trying to find somewhere where everybody will eat. So lots of good reasons there to change your eating habits. What we need to do now is go and have a look at what you actually are eating. OK, come with us. Natalie and Stephen hope to shock globetrotting Kate into action with the help of a little excess baggage. Right. What do you think these represent? Holidays. That's right. Today, we want to see what it is you are eating on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I'd like you to go and grab one of those suitcases for me, please. OK. And then unzip it and then tip out the contents. What do you think that represents? How much cheese I eat. In what sort of time frame? A year. 
<laughs> well, you'd be mistaken. All right, go over to maybe that case behind you. Are you in shock yet? Yes. Well, I'm afraid you're not quite done yet. I can't believe I ate that much cheese. You know what, Kate? It's still not done. You're joking. <laughs> Six suitcases worth of cheese is how much you're eating in a year. I'm stunned. It just looks horrible. The thing is that you're having about that much in a day. So 300 grams of cheese, 365 days a year, works out as 140 kilos of cheese that you're having in a year. And the thing is that there's no harm in having a little bit of cheese. It's got some great nutrients in, it's got calcium, it's got protein, but you're missing out on a whole range of other vitamins, minerals, and fiber. So let's magic fast forward to four weeks from now. And what would you like to achieve by then? I'd love to be able to go into a restaurant and order a meal without having to tamper with what it says on the menu. That would be great. And what about in terms of uh, your travels? It would mean that we could go to places that at the moment we've not been able to go to because of the food issue. So our challenge to you is at the end of four weeks you will be able to be going on holiday with your family and choosing something in a restaurant and having a really fun, delicious, harmonious family meal. I do want to change, but the thought of the reality of that is the frightening bit. Kate's obviously really up for change, but what's also obvious is that actually the prospect of changing makes her really, really anxious. It's hard for somebody who doesn't have these problems to understand just what a frightening prospect this all is for her. And these are very long established habits for her. She's been eating like this for over 30 years. We're expecting to change that in just a few weeks. It's quite a tall order for her and for us. Kate's family have already booked their next holiday, a European odyssey ending in Venice. Kate's determined to spend the next four weeks getting up to speed so she can chow down Italian style. Eating a meal while I'm on holiday this summer would be fantastic. The thing that really worries me is the process up until that point, and I know that that's going to push me really outside my comfort zone. Before she can tackle the deficiencies in Kate's cheesy diet, Natalie must first understand the extent of her problem with other foods. If someone's been living on cheese and cold cheese for 30 years, their palate is going to be really confronted by other sorts of foods. So I'm curious to find out where Kate stands in terms of other textures, other tastes, hot food, cold food. Where will she go with other foods? Kate, the purpose of today is for me to really try to get a handle on your food problem. So what is it that you will eat, that you won't eat, and why? What's going on around all of your food? So I thought the best place for me to start, having had a look at your food diary, is to start on familiar territory for you. That's not like the normal roast dinner I'd eat. That carrot looks like baby mush. It's disgusting, and the gravy is completely the wrong colour. When I'm at my mum's, it always looks the same and smells the same. So you would only eat your mum's? I've tasted things other than my mum's and I've not liked them. So now I just stick to my mum's because I know I like that and mm. it's safe to eat. So it's the familiarity that gives you a safety around what you eat. I mean, would you even try any of that? No. Mm. The thought of putting that in my mouth, it's real fear. It's... And the thought of doing it really upsets me. Mm. I'm not gonna, not gonna get you to eat that. But so, so what, what's, what's around, what, what's upsetting? What's? I honestly don't know. Mm. But the thought of, and this is what I said, the, the getting the food from the plate to my mouth, is the hardest thing. Mm. You've mentioned that you will eat some fruit. Bananas, no. When you slice a banana, it's all slimy and... Just do that for me, if you would. 
But see, it sticks, it's slimy. I mean, could you even bite into that? I couldn't bite into it. I could maybe cut a little bit off it and try that. There you go. Can I chew it? I think that's enough. Are you all right? Yeah. I suspect that none of this is a pleasant experience. And your palate's been used to having very, very particular foods for over 30 years. And so anything that confronts that familiarity is going to be, I suspect for you, unpleasant. Do you want some water? Yes, please. I think the hardest thing for Kate today was to actually show how dramatically she can react to certain foods on a very deep gut level. Bursting into tears at the sight of an unfamiliar roast dinner is odd. It really brought something up for her. We don't know what that is. And it's not only Natalie who's left questioning Kate's overwhelming reaction to unfamiliar food. I don't know why I couldn't put that food in my mouth. All I knew was that every part of my body was screaming at me, no, don't do it. And I couldn't physically bring myself to do it. And that's how I feel when I'm presented with a curry or a lasagna or any meal that most other people would normally eat. I'm having to realise this evening that kind of doing this, I'm going to have to face that more often. Day three for Kate begins with a special delivery. Natalie sent her a hamper packed with challenges designed to expand the range and quantity of foods that she eats. The worst nightmares, bananas and tomatoes. I'm not sure which is worse. Along with the nutritious goodies, Natalie has enclosed some written instructions. Go through your kitchen cupboards and throw out all the cheese, crackers and crisps. No eating them away from the house, they are now ex-food. I can't see myself replacing cheese with this lot. I think it's a bit extreme. Once husband Jeff arrives home, a reluctant Kate ropes him into the proceedings. Lots got to go. <laughs> something in the foil there. Oh, jeez. I'm not sure what's in here. Would that be cheese? Oh, oh it's cheese. It's a bit more cheese. It's our everything. There's, there's nothing hidden behind the potatoes. Nothing. Oh. Ah. Another one. OK, that's it. It's up for the bin now. Can I not just keep a bit? What am I going to eat for the next four weeks? It's a very sad event. <laughs> That's it. Oh, bye, cheese. One of the biggest nutritional benefits of cheese is zinc, essential in maintaining a healthy immune system. Now Kate's given cheese the chop, she can keep up her daily intake of zinc by eating four slices of roast beef, a big bag of Brazil nuts, or 75 ounces of baked beans. That's five cans worth to you and me. Kate may well have given cheese the chop, but Natalie still has concerns over the effects it's had on her body as the staple part of her diet for over 30 years. She's arranged for Kate's blood to be tested by Dr. Pixie McKenna, a GP with a special interest in eating problems. This morning, Natalie's brought Kate to hear the findings. The first thing that showed up in your blood test was that you have very high levels of cholesterol. The other thing is, because you're taking in all of this processed cheese, you're not actually taking in enough roughage in your diet. So your high fat and your lack of roughage are going to lead to digestive problems. You're laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had...? Yeah, I do get constipation quite a lot. Right. With Kate having fessed up, Pixie wants to show her the internal effect of her stodgy diet. She's got 10 metres of tubing, half what's inside the average person. Could have up to 25 metres of bone, so it's quite a lot, isn't it? She's prepared two liquids. One represents fibre-rich food, and the other, Kate's cheesy diet. I want to get you to transport the fibre-rich food 
right through the intestine for me. <laughs> now, what do you notice about that? It's running down quite quickly, no yeah. problem at all. Can I get you to do the same thing with the cheesy stuff? Oh, dear. It's actually painful to watch that. <laughs> But to get that to the end, you're just going to have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And that's what you're doing every single day of your life. Instead of clogging up her bowels with processed cheese, Kate could get the recommended daily amount of fibre from eight ounces of cooked peas, or keep herself regular with five pears. And if neither of those appealed, 18 poppadoms contain roughly the same amount of fibre. I suppose the other worry is that, you know, with constipation, you end up getting things like piles, which are varicose veins in your bottom end, which are, you're smiling at me again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> are, you, are they, is that something that you've had? I've had them operated on twice and I'm due to go in again for the right. third time because they've just come back again each time. You're a recurrent offender. Yes. Yeah. It's a very, very sore operation as well, isn't it? It is extremely painful, yes. Yeah. So, Kate, had you really, really made the link between your terrible diet and the piles? I think I had, but it's very easy to blame it on something else. It seems to me that you've had all this information, but you've put your head in the sand. Yeah. Because to fix it, I'd have to do something that I didn't want to do. I mean, for me, the most concerning thing about your diet is the fact that a diet of high fat and low fibre increases your risk of bowel cancer. And if I was told that, I'd be frightened. The most shocking thing was the increased risk of bowel cancer. I think it's something that was always at the back of my mind, but I like to fool myself in thinking that I was doing things to reduce the risk of that, when in reality, I'm not. I think we've got a problem here in as much as Kate's quite familiar with the things that we were talking about today with Pixie. But that familiarity, knowing that, hasn't been enough of an incentive in the past to make her change. So I'm thinking, well, is it really going to make a great deal of difference now? There's something blocking her from having that information, knowing the danger she's in, and making the changes. As Kate's first week draws to a close, Life without cheese is still a struggle. Natalie's asked her to try one new piece of fruit or veg each day. Today, she tackles her slimiest adversary. Mm. <laughs> oh, that is absolutely disgusting. For the next few weeks, I'll try. But I think that when this is over, this is the one thing I will never, ever eat again. Today, Kate has her first session with clinical psychologist Stephen Briars. It's a chance for him to probe Kate's earliest memories of her eating problem. All right. Kate, start off with, do you want to just tell me a little bit about the eating problem that you have and how it affects you? The main issue I have is foods that aren't familiar to me. Whenever I'm in a situation where I have to eat them, my body kind of goes on shutdown. That's when I start to feel sick and start to retch at the thought of it. All right, so these familiar foods, these foods that you can eat, are there any common characteristics to them? The majority of them are dry and crunchy foods, or foods that I remember eating from being a child. My mum's roast dinner, we've had, we had every week growing up, so that's safe. But I'll only eat my mum's roast dinner. So really, only those foods that became safe within the context of the home have really remained safe. OK, so when did these problems begin? I can never remember eating normally, but I think school was the start of it all. Mm -hmm. I can remember the slot bucket at the end of the table that you scraped the leftover food in. It looked different, it smelled different. So when I first started school, although my mum thought I was having a school dinner, I wasn't actually eating any of it because it was different. Okay. 
it is clear that for you, foods that are mixed or are sloppy have certain associations in the back of your mind. You know, I need to go away from here and really think about how we're going to get you past those mental hurdles. So you start to have experiences which, if not positive, are at least more neutral. Kate evidently has quite a complex relationship with food. She's got this range of familiar foods for her which feel safe, and then outside of that, any food that's unfamiliar obviously feels really unsafe for her. Um, she tells me that her issues with food began at primary school. So I think the task ahead is to do some digging around what may be some quite painful memories for her. As Kate begins her second week on a new diet, it's time for Natalie and Stephen to catch up and discuss plans to push her forward. From my point of view, I think the priority is to try and explore this whole idea of not only the places that were safe for Kate, but maybe the places that were less safe. So I'm going to try and find out a little bit more about Kate's background, and particularly those early years at school, which I think may hold the key to the evolution of some of the problems that she's got today. And the other thing that I'm concerned about is Megan and Georgia. And I just think that, you know, their diets are in such trouble themselves that I think I need to get them on board really looking at changing their diet so it's a family effort and they're all working together. Determined to give Kate the best possible chance of success, Natalie heads to Manchester for a rendezvous with Kate's family. Jeff, hi. Kate's diet might have been declared a cheese-free zone, but Natalie's got quite the opposite in mind for the rest of the family. So, I have gathered you here today in order to ask you a big favour to help Kate in what she's going through for the next few weeks. Now, what I would like you to do is eat the exact same diet that Kate has been eating most of her life for a week. I don't think it would be sufficient to keep me going and keep mm. me at work, to be quite honest. Yeah. I mean, the reason I'm asking you to do it is not random. I thought if you had an idea of how Kate must be feeling, then it would be easier for you to empathise with her as she's going along through these ups and downs. I'd probably find it somewhat boring, but I'm willing to try it. If it will help Kate. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> I can't cope with the amounts of cheese at one sitting that she coped with. But I'll have the same things, but not possibly in the same quantities, you know. OK. Now, Georgia, I've got something different for you and Megan to take on. Because you two already have a diet that's astonishingly similar to your mother's, what I'd like you to be doing is to work with her and be trying all the new things that she is. Because really, part of her changing her diet is also helping you to change yours. So you think you can take that on? It will be a struggle, but I'll do it. So you'll do it for your mum? Yeah. And what about doing it for yourself? I'll do it for me as well. The next day, Jack and Jean prepare to savour one of their daughter's specialities. <laughs> Here we go. When I think that this is what Catherine eats most of the time, it would become very bland and very boring. She cracks and she's on all right, but not every meal. I'm gagging on this because it's so dry. You know, a tomato or a chutney or a little bit of salad with it would really help. What would be for tea then? Baked potato and cheese? Mm, yeah. Mm. Whilst her parents are starting to lose their enthusiasm... I don't think I want to see a jack potato and cheese again. Go on. For Kate and the girls, there's not even a sniff of cheddar in the air. In with the new, we've got to eat new foods at least three times a day, some banana and some tomato. Salad for lunch, plus raw green beans, red, yellow and green peppers. I don't like any of them at all. Let's think positive, ladies. It smells. I not taste of anything. Uh, taste me again. How much do you want? Right, next, wild rock in it. That is minging. Oh, that's foul. That's rank. <sighs> I'm going to be brave. Mm. It tastes 
meaty. It tastes of disgusting apples. It tastes of, you know, that plastic stuff that you can toys. Okay, ladies, tea time. Mmm. Uh, it's plants. It's just a struggle to get through. There's nothing to liven it up a bit. It'd be, it'd be all right with a bit of cheese. As week two comes to an end, Natalie's challenges turn up the heat on Kate and the girls. So far, the only hot meals they eat are roast dinners round at Kate's mum's house. Now, they must try eating some of their own. Do you like it, Mum? <coughs> Despite struggling herself to eat anything cooked, Kate does her best to rally the girls. Georgia, that's carrots. You like carrots? Yes, I know it's carrots. It's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen and tasted. How come she got more than me? Oh, for goodness sake, does it matter? Neither of you have eaten it. Mm -hmm. By the end of week two, and with hot food still a no-go, they're surviving on salad and bread. And Kate's patience is wearing thin. I just don't know what to have to eat now. I'm just constantly hungry. I've got no cheese and crackers in. The only thing I can snack on is raw veg and salad and fruit. Unless I find something I like. So I'm bored, I'm hungry, and I'm fed up. With Kate struggling to embrace her new diet, Stephen's keen to understand why her mum's home-cooked food was safe and familiar as a child, but school dinners gave her so many issues. Hello, thanks for coming along. Are you ready for a trip down memory lane? OK. Come on in. OK, so here we are in the hall. What, has this gym room changed much since you were here? No, not, not really. It was always similar to some we used to have our lunch in here as well, um, on little tables. Coming here today, what's that producing for you? I think it's made me realise that it's not the building. It was the people in the building that didn't make my life pleasurable, really. Okay. I'd, you know, I didn't enjoy it. Okay. Well, you're intriguing me thus far. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we go in somewhere where we can sit down and you can tell me a little bit more about that? OK. OK. I'm getting the impression from you that perhaps your early school experience wasn't that happy a time. Do you want to just tell me a bit more about it? When I was at school, I never felt as though I ever achieved anything. It was either very good academic achievement or very good sporting achievement that got you credit while you were at school. And because I didn't excel in either of those, um, I always felt as though I wasn't valued while I was at school. And I think teachers had the favourites, and that wasn't fair. Just give me a few adjectives to describe the nature of school. Frustrating. Frustrating. Annoying. Mm -hmm. I, I used to get really, really angry with it. Mm -hmm. It was unpleasant. Mm -hmm. They're all negative mm. and very strong feelings. Strong, negative feelings, yeah. What about meal times. Do you have any memories? You used to sit at little tables and they'd give the cups and stuff out and they used to have the bucket at the end of the table that all the slops went into. And I can remember being repulsed by that. Um, and I can remember sitting at the dinner table and just not eating it and there was no way they were going to make me. And rejecting those foods, those foods associated with school, in effect, you're also rejecting everything that that school had come to stand for in your head, which sounds quite powerful, actually, now you, now you talk about it. I mean, the tone of it seems really quite, quite strong. <laughs> and I can understand, in the light of what you've been telling me, why you might choose not to take into your body <laughs> and make part of yourself anything that this place was serving up. Good feelings are all organised around the foods that are familiar for you and are associated with the comfort that comes from home. Foods 
at school perhaps become symbolic for you in some way of a whole bunch of really quite powerful negative feelings. I'm really quite intrigued by the anger and the frustration that Kate's just revealed. It seems that there are times in her childhood where she really felt quite miserable and quite left out. And that, in combination with her reaction to the smell of school dinners, seems to have resulted in her rejecting anything she ate away from home. Her perspective now is really quite skewed. And I think my first challenge is to try and get Kate to recognise just how distorted her perceptions have become. Having shed some clarity on the emotional roots of her problem, Kate's in a defiant mood. I think that it definitely stems back to primary school. Like, if at my age I've still got these really strong feelings that I hate it, then it must have, have come from, from there. And I don't want primary school to get the better of me. And, you know, if that's where the root cause of this issue lies, then I'm more determined to get over it. The next day, and with renewed vigour, Kate attacks Natalie's next challenge. You need to learn that fruit you enjoy whole can also taste nice in different form. Such enthusiasm, ladies. So we're going to go for stewed apples. Right, according to the recipe, four to five minutes and that's done. It's just making me feel ill, the look of it. Even the smell, it's stupid. I like cinnamon, I like nutmeg, but the smell's making me feel sick. You'll be fine with it. It's not going to kill you. <laughs> I can't eat it. It just seems so stupid. The kids are in there giving it a go, and I just can't put it in there. I'm just repulsed by it. Oh. And it's stupid, and I know it is, but I just can't do it. <sighs> Once the girls have had their fill of stewed apples, Kate gives the slop another go. It just looks like someone's thrown up in the bowl. I can't. I can't even get close to it. It's absolutely vile. I can't put it in my mouth. And why does a bowl of food do that to me? It's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. It's pathetic. With Kate having hit an emotional brick wall, Stephen's next session could not come sooner. Aware that her childhood feelings have been clouding her outlook, he wants Kate to see the bigger picture when it comes to food. He's arranged to meet her at the local flea market. What Kate tends to focus in on when she approaches a new food is its moisture content and she will ignore every other bit of information about the food concerned. I want her to understand that what she's perceiving is not what's there, but what she's interpreting. Stephen's devised a special activity to illustrate his theory. Do you want to try these on for size? <laughs> right now. I'm aware that your vision is pretty restricted now, OK? okay. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you round a few of the stalls here. We're going to examine certain <laughs> objects. OK. And I'm going to see how much you can tell me about them with the limited information you have that's going into your brain at the moment. OK. OK. <laughs> OK. All right, I'm going over here first. I just want you to just, just stand there. Okay, so. Here we go. Can you tell me what that is? I can't see anything. Describe what I'm holding. A money box. I'm going to let you touch a part of the object. Got any idea what this might be? It looks like a feather. OK. No. I've a new object in my hand. I'm going to bring it close. Tell me when you can see I've got something. It's a big, long, orange, yellow thing. Uh-huh. Tell me more about it. It looks tubular, like a candle or something like that. If I let you touch it, one finger. 
What do you think it is now? It could be a washing line rolled up. Alright, what made you think it could be a washing line? Because of the feel of it. Alright, so you got a lot more information and that totally shifted your perception of the object away from being a candle, potentially, to something very different, like a washing line. Yeah. Okay, do you want to take the glasses off and see how far you get hanging your clothes up on that? <laughs> Just with the information that came to you through touching it, suddenly, in your head, it became potentially a very different object, didn't it? So some kind of transformation took place. Do you see how that might apply? <laughs> when I see food, I'm not getting the full picture. I'm just seeing it and having that response to it. However, <laughs> when I cook food, I made some stewed apples with the girls. I knew exactly what was going in it and I could see the point of it. I liked the taste of apple, yet I couldn't bring myself to taste it at the end, even though I was well aware of what I'd put into the pan. This is partly a matter of practice and really continuing to talk yourself through so that those unconscious perceptions, which are very powerful, don't kick in. You've got to ground it all the time in observation, in your knowledge of the facts about what's there. And I believe you could. I guess it's a question of how long that would take for you. And I guess that's something that you need to keep working at. Within a few hours, Stephen's theories about Kate's negative perception of unfamiliar food seem to have struck a chord. At the time, I thought it was all right, but I didn't think it would make any huge impact. But then after the session and, you know, I thought about it and he's absolutely right. The pieces of the jigsaw were kind of fitting into place and it all it was all starting to make sense. And since since then, my attitude towards the food I've got to try has been far more positive. Kate is now into her third week with the experts. Raw fruit and veg are going down a treat. But while she does her best to try hot and sloppy dishes, every meal is a struggle for her. She has faced a lot of difficulties because she knows that she doesn't like certain things and certain textures but she's been doing, trying and trying but I think she's been doing really well. And she's not cheated. <laughs> Despite her hard work, Kate's chances of eating a restaurant meal look slimmer than spaghetti. Aware that the Venetian holiday is only 10 days away, Natalie and Stephen meet up to plan a new strategy. I had an interesting time with Kate at the marketplace. Uh, we did an exercise which I think really did start to bring home the point for her that the way she currently sees food you know, is quite distorted. I think it helped her and I think it will start to kind of you know, change her relationship with food. But my concern is that it's too little too late. She's got this final challenge coming up really soon then. I think that's the thing. There is a danger that Kate will get to Venice and she won't really have a great deal of success and that will knock her confidence and then she won't take any of this forward. Really, I need to be building on what you've been doing and actually be helping her very consciously in the direction of the challenge and therefore have her building towards being able to succeed at a meal out in Venice. So Natalie heads to Manchester and persuades Kate to visit a well-known Italian restaurant. She wants to try out some of Stephen's techniques to demystify unfamiliar foods. Right, Kate, so you can see where we are. What's that nervous grin? I think food might be uh, involved. Really? <laughs> the thing is that your goal is to be able to go on holiday to Italy and choose something from the menu and enjoy a meal. And the purpose of today is for you to get a bit more of a feel about Italian food, getting a bit excited about it. So why don't we just go and meet the chef then? OK. Head chef Steve Hildebrand has been lined up by Natalie to demonstrate to Kate that the pasta she's terrified of is actually made up of ingredients she's already conquered. You're going to incorporate all the flour into the egg. This is you making your own food. What we're going to do now is going to feed this through the pasta machine. Yeah. This is good. And then all I do is feed it through the other side of the machine. You've made pasta. That was good fun. 
so I think there's only one thing left to do with that. Up until now, Kate's never managed to swallow anything that involves a tomato-based sauce. Come on. <laughs> hey. It doesn't look very appetising. No disrespect. <laughs> to me, it doesn't look very appetising. Why? Because it's all sloppy. Why don't you try just a little bit of the pancetta? That's OK. So how about a piece of pancetta and a piece of pasta? Fairly decent bit of pasta, let me see. <laughs> Come on, not one cubic millimetre. How about that, with a bit of pancetta on it? Just taste the ham, taste the pancetta. My mouth is tingling now and it is quite pleasant. It's a really nice feeling I've got in my mouth, that's fab. I suspect that that's the largest combination of flavours and ingredients you've ever tasted in one go. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I think Kate has reached a whole other level with food. So, working on her interest with food and getting her really inspired by the ingredients, what's going into it, making it herself, especially the pasta making, has completely changed her perspective in one afternoon, just like that. She can really see that she could start to get excited about making and eating food. Back at home, Kate's feeling just as optimistic. When I first walked in and realised it was an Italian restaurant, my hands were sweating. But once I saw the ingredients and I recognised them all, on their own they weren't scary. And it meant the dish wasn't as frightening at the end. And I think that that has motivated me at home and to get the girls more involved. Because if I can get them making a dish with ingredients that they're comfortable with, then hopefully they'll be more prepared to have a go at the end product as well. Natalie has asked Kate and the girls to try making food fun by cooking their own Italian recipes every day leading up to their holiday challenge. Not everyone's feeling inspired. It looks minging now, it smells minging. I've not tried it before and I didn't ever want to. You're supposed to be enjoying this. This is supposed to be having fun with food, girl. I'm having fun making it. I've had a gas mask. There we go, I'm going brave, girls. Any peppers, anybody? Good girl. Is that all you're having on yours, Georgia? I need to put more cheese on it to decontaminate it. Hey, I bet mine's gorgeous. Just think how much flavour mine's going to have. I could go and live in Naples making pizzas like that. Georgia's? Are you eating the bits with tomato on? I will try it, because if it tastes anything like tomato ketchup, it'll be minging. It's not minging, it's just different. Mm, differently minging. A few weeks ago, there's no way I'd have eaten a pizza with tomato on. Whereas now, it was strange, but it didn't make me feel sick because I was thinking positively about it, which is great. So do you think if we went away, you'd be able to ask for a pizza with a little bit of tomato on? Yeah. Well done, Meg. What about you on holiday? What do you think you're going to be doing? I think I'd still ask for it without... Sorry, Mum. It's OK. You've got nothing to apologise for. You tried your best, darling. Today, Kate and her family are jetting off to Italy. As her final challenge of a pasta meal looms, Kate puts on a brave face. I'm feeling really excited about going on holiday. I can't wait. And I'm just trying not to think about the food bit till I get there. Because I've got so much else to think about while I'm packing. I haven't got time to panic about anything else. The floating city of Venice is home to some of Italy's finest restaurants, as well as its famous canals and gondolas. 
When we came out, I was feeling really confident about the meals while we were out here. But then, of course, when you arrive and the strange smells and the look of everything, so now I'm not quite as confident as I was when we flew out yesterday. It's the evening of the big meal, and Kate and the family have chosen a canal-side restaurant, safe in the knowledge there's pizza on the menu. I do think that I will try new things, because I promised Mum that if she did, then I will. But um, <laughs> I'm just hoping it's not too strange, because of the places we're going, the food can be a bit ethnic. Tonight, Kate hopes to set a good example by ordering pasta a million miles away from cheese for her palate. I'm really, really struggling. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. With everyone looking for edible dishes, the waiter brings bad news. Pizza's off the menu. Sorry, sweetheart. Could you have some plain pasta, do Spaghetti steak. I can get you some plain fried chicken and chips. I've tried every type of chicken on every holiday we've been on. It's minging. Yeah. It's your choice. It's fine, people. They always put All right. spices and stuff on. OK, and you're just going to have some chips with that. All right, darling. Can I have the spaghetti with meat sauce? Thank you. Do you have uh, spaghetti bolognese with the meat sauce? Can I have French fries, please? French fries. I've had chips because it's the only thing I'll eat. But if I get chicken, it'll probably dip into something like bears or something. <laughs> Even though I've only had about three mouthfuls of it, I'm really proud of myself because I retched on the first mouthful, but I kept on going. So to keep on going through that for me is a real, a real bonus. Cheers. How are your chips, sweetheart? They're nice, but they've got that foreign taste, you know that. <laughs> Natalie and Stephen may have had more than three mouthfuls in mind when they set the challenge, but tonight it's Kate who's setting the goals. In the past, spaghetti bolognese has completely repulsed me. And even though the first couple of mouthfuls tonight I was retching on, I kept thinking positive and I managed a couple more. Fancy pizza. Some people having maybe several mouthfuls of a meal wouldn't, wouldn't be that great. But I think the fact that she's even been able to do that is extraordinary. We're all a bit happier now because we know that Mum will try things on future holidays. It's going to take some time to get used to, but hopefully in another 12 months, maybe 18 months, then I'll have cracked it. One month later and the experts are back to find out how the travellers have fared. Pizza or plate of pasta and we'll be delighted any more and we'll be over the moon. Anything slightly moist would be good. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. 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 A quick tour of the kitchen gives Natalie concrete proof of change. Vegetables. Yes. Pepper. Onion. Strawberries, grapes. And there, mine. Are you going to well. be eating those? Yes. Yeah. Not now. Yeah. Aren't they lovely? They're nicer on the vine than off as well. A few weeks ago, you wouldn't have even touched a tomato physically with your hands. I know. Now you're going, oh yes, I have to have them <laughs> off the vine and being all poncy about your tomatoes, which is great. I reckon that is success. <laughs> Kate's diet has now expanded to include soups, fish, and a wide variety of fruit and vegetables. Even spicy chicken fajitas are on the menu at Kate's place. I'm enjoying yours. Mm, not bad. <laughs> 
It's quite nice, it's spicy. It's burning my mouth. Mm. My lips are tingling away. It does sound like there's been a real shift in the culture around food in the family and much more open-mindedness now and much more determination to succeed. I mean, I really hope they do stick with it because I think if they do, they really can get to a place where everybody's going to be comfortable with a far wider range of foods. I said at the beginning of this, the biggest challenge for me would be to put food in my mouth and that's what I'm able to do now. For me, making that progress in such a short time is phenomenal. Click on screen for more videos of extraordinary humans.